Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome today to our program, The Journey to Juneteenth. AARP California is extremely happy to offer unique content to AARP members in California and elsewhere. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization for people 50 plus, where our vision is for a society in which all people live with dignity and purpose and fulfill their goals and dreams. And in California, we're focused on de developing livable communities for all ages. To learn more about the work ARP is doing at the national, state, and local levels here in California, you can visit www.aarp.org forward slash CA. We hope that you have been part of our Black Music Month conversation series this month, where we talked with Michael Dauphin, one of our AARP California Executive Council members, Lalin St. Juice, a Black musician from the Bay Area, Tammy Hall, accomplished jazz pianist. And we also have conversations still scheduled with Leroy Downs, longtime jazz musician and executive, and Yvette M. Devereaux, the first Black conductor of the LA Philharmonic and classical music artist. And to top it all off, we have a one week long concert series with KJLH during the week of June 21st. That starts Monday, where we will kick off with another conversation with Michael Dolphin while paying tribute to Sam Cooke. All of this and more can be found at our www.aarp.org forward slash Black Music Month page. Once you're registered, you'll also receive another gift. We're just showering gifts. You'll be given exclusive access to live performance by Tammy Hall, thanks to San Jose Jazz and New Works. So with a flurry of activity over the last 48 hours, uh, 48, actually 48 plus hours, we wanna take this opportunity to share a statement from our state director, Nancy McPherson. While Juneteenth can be a time for celebration, more important, given our nation's tragic history of slavery and racial injustice, this newest federal holiday can serve as an impetus for reflection and dialogue that raises awareness among each of us about what it means for every American to enjoy the freedoms of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. AARP's mission of enhancing the quality of life for all as we age aligns with the Constitution's promise of freedoms that should be enjoyed by every American. AARP staff and volunteers work diligently to ensure that AARP is both a fierce advocate or defender for available, affordable, and accessible supports and services that allow all AARP, all people, to live their best lives. And we are a wise friend that provides the information and education members need to inform their consumer and life choices. In that way, AARP demonstrates its commitment to creating livable communities and communities, I mean, livable states and communities that allow those who so choose to remain in their homes and communities throughout their lifetime. So today, we are gonna get right down to it. We are looking forward to learning from Dr. Tanai Jackson. Not, Dr. Jackson is a U.S. and United States, of course, historian with a focus on the transition from slavery to freedom. Her research examines the politics of race and partisanship after the Civil War. Dr. Jackson earned her Ph.D. at the University of Maryland College Park and has held positions at San Jose State University, Berea College, and is currently assistant professor of history at California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo. 
She abides by a punk rock pedagogy uh, whereby anything can be learned. Everything can be deconstructed and nothing can be lost. So we bring on and we introduce Dr. Tanai Jackson. Hi, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you all about Juneteenth and um, yeah, I'll get right to it. It's a, it's been an interesting week and it's a, now that this is a national holiday, I'm excited to give a little bit of, of history about it and talk more about what it means for us. Let me share my screen here with you all. Great. Thank you, Joy. So the story goes, on June 19th, 1865, Major General Gordon Granger marched into Galveston with 2,000 United States soldiers, including seven regiments of United States colored troops, fresh off victory at Appomattox, where Robert E. Lee had surrendered. Bringing liberation to their own people, federal soldiers marched into Galveston Town Square and Granger issued General Order Number 3, proclaiming slavery illegal in Texas and thereby ending slavery in the Southern United States of America. It was the defeat of the Confederacy. Freedom, they say, ensued. Galvestonian Felix Haywood took an accounting of the day. He talked about the soldiers coming. He said everybody was running and walking and riding, singing. He said everyone was walking on golden clouds. Hallelujah, he said. Everybody went wild. We all felt like heroes and nobody had made us that way but ourselves. We was free, just like that, we was free. It's the quintessential origin story of a national holiday. It's got it all. Freedom, a multiracial US liberating army, Texas. I don't know if that's why it has caught on nationally as a way to celebrate freedom days, but that is something to think about. But in Texas, it has been celebrated every year since Felix Haywood's moment of Jubilee. Okay, like all holidays, Juneteenth has its familiar stories and symbols. Somewhere at my parents' house, there's a box of t-shirts and they all have this symbol on them. It's the quintessential symbol for Juneteenth, the fists with the chain breaking. The two on the right, I think are super interesting because those you can tell are post-1968 symbols for Juneteenth. I don't think these symbols would have been around before that. This is a sort of homage to the 1968 Olympics, right? The Black Power Salute. That's been incorporated into Juneteenth. Juneteenth has room for that stuff. It's a reminder that Juneteenth as a holiday is about the continuity of freedom struggles. And this processional nature of freedom itself uh, the time it takes to be persistent, the insistence on making notions of freedom tangible in our daily lives. It's classic Juneteenth. Like all holidays, it's imbibed with mythology and lore. Everybody has that Texas family that swears, that their daddy swears, that their granddaddy heard that a black soldier rode all the way from Washington, D.C. to bring the news on a mule given to him personal from Abraham Lincoln himself. <laughs> He rode into Oklahoma and told them freedom had come. Then on he went to Arkansas and delivered the freedom news. And finally, on June 19th, he rode into Galveston delivering the death blow to slavery. Free at last. Of course, lore and mythology is part of making holidays. And I'm going to play around a little bit with that today. I'm gonna give you my own version of a Juneteenth origin history. Um, there are so many freedom stories, but you can kind of only tell one when you're gonna give a talk like this. My story is still a Western, what can I say? Uh, and I wanna go back to this bit here, the box of t-shirts and how I celebrated Juneteenth. Now, my family are from Texas. 
And it's sort of interesting that the Juneteenth mythology feels like a Western story, not just because it happened in Texas, but because when my family migrated west to California during another great migration during World War II, they brought the stories with them. And so that turns out how we were celebrating Juneteenth further west from Texas. When I started hearing about all of this becoming national, I kind of thought to myself, I always thought this was a Western thing. Well, it's become national now. But again, the origin story I'm going to tell is still kind of a Western, but it doesn't start with the Emancipation Proclamation. That was one thing I always heard from my father when he started talking about what Juneteenth was on Juneteenth. He would say, it was two years after the Emancipation Proclamation that people in Texas finally found out they were free. They'd been keeping it from them. It's all part of the lore and mythology. But as I dug into it, I found, wait a minute, that's not exactly what happened. And my story doesn't exactly start with the Emancipation Proclamation. Juneteenth is a specific story of a culmination of freedom days that were won specifically through the Civil War. Abolition was a process. A lot of times when my students try to talk about this moment, I ask them to make me a timeline. So I made us a timeline of abolition to think about how Juneteenth became Juneteenth. Now, the policy that made slavery unconstitutional in the United States of America is the 13th Amendment. As we can sort of see on this timeline, it's proposed in 1864, actually, but not passed through Congress until 1865. It's not ratified by enough states until December 6th, 1865. And you see, I've stuck Juneteenth in right in the middle of that year. Maybe I should talk about the Emancipation Proclamation for just a moment first. In January 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was passed. In many ways, it was a military story, just like Juneteenth is. The Emancipation Proclamation itself was sort of toothless in that it did not apply to enslaved people in the Union states. If you see those four states that are in red there, those are slave states that remained with the Union during the Civil War. Of course, the gray is the Confederacy and the blue, the Union, and all those states that don't have anything shouldn't even really have those lines around them because they're not states at all yet their territories. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation did not exactly free anybody, and it definitely was not policy that made slavery illegal, but it was a very significant military order. You see, for the Emancipation Proclamation to work, your the owners had to be rebellious. It was a warning. So if we go back to the timeline, And look here, it starts much earlier. In 1862, there's that United States Militia Act. Let's move backwards. That Militia Act was the warning for the Emancipation Proclamation. And what it said is that if you don't surrender and come back into the Union immediately, well, before January 1st, then we're gonna take your slaves. Lincoln had never threatened slavery where it stood in any of his you know, campaign uh, promises or events leading up to this moment. He wasn't after slavery where it existed. He did talk about not expanding slavery, but as president of the United States, that really wasn't his wheelhouse. He had no authority to say whether or not slavery would expand into those white territories we saw before. So the Emancipation Proclamation was a military move. It told the Confederacy, if you don't rejoin the Union now, then we're going to end slavery there. Of course, Abraham Lincoln wasn't president of the Confederacy. And the Confederate States didn't go along with it. I mean, they didn't recognize him as president. So in that way, for the Emancipation Proclamation to actually free anybody, it had to come at military victory. It also did one other extremely important thing. Starting at this moment here, again, where the Militia Act comes into play in 1862, it also allowed black men to join the United States Army. Now, how did this come to pass? If Lincoln wasn't about freeing the slaves per se, although he was against slavery as 
a, a system, if you will, uh, then how, how does this even happen? This is why I take my timeline back to 1860. If you look at 1860 when secession happens, it does something very significant in the Confederate States. It dismantles the system that had kept slavery in place. In 1861, when men go off to fight for the Confederacy, they're also breaking apart a system that had held slavery in place, namely things like slave patrols and slave masters who are now off fighting this war. Now, enslaved people have been escaping slavery since slavery, but now they're escaping in a critical mass. Why? Because that system of violence that's held slavery in place has been dismantled. Now, escaping can be done in these huge numbers in a critical mass, and now people have an idea of where they might go to union lines. Maybe the enemy of my enemy is also my friend. In 1862, when the Confederacy initiates the first draft anywhere in the United States, numbers increase even more. Now, this forces the United States government to make a decision. What are we going to do about all of these people who are now escaping and entering Union lines? The United States doesn't even recognize the Confederacy as a country. So to that end, the law that's still in place is the Fugitive Slave Act. Fugitive Slave Act says you return those people back to their rightful owners. Now, military generals, of course, think that this is a, a, a pretty bad idea, right? I mean, if we send enslaved people back to the Confederacy, then those people are gonna be used as compulsory labor to grow food for the Confederacy, to build fortifications for the Confederacy. This doesn't seem like the best idea. It's this movement by people who are using this freedom of their feet initially right off the bat that then causes the United States government to act and pass what will become the Emancipation Proclamation. But again, the Emancipation Proclamation is not abolition policy. What it does is give the United States government the authority to confiscate the property of enemy combatants, namely their slave property. But also what it does mean is that every time the Union Army defeats the Confederate Army in the South, reclaims that land and plants the American flag, now those enslaved people can be freed. This turns the United States Army, which now includes high numbers of black troops, 200,000, over 200,000 men will fight into liberating armies. This also means that there's a whole lot of freedom days. If we look at this map here, um, what I'm going to do is play it and it's gonna play across. Um, I'll kind of keep you updated on what the dates are because that little blue square is really hard to see. But the things that are gonna pop up here, and this is from um, a database called Visualizing Emancipation. And it has what's called emancipation events, which are essentially any time enslaved people rose up during this time during the war. And it, the blue dots are going to be Union Army locations. Now, we're in 1861 right now. This is immediately after the fighting starts, right? So like I said before, once the fighting starts and people are preoccupied, the structures that had kept slavery in place break down. Now, little events like this had been happening again, since there was slavery, but now they're happening in a critical mass. Freedom has started. And it's important to recognize that to understand why Juneteenth is considered a final moment. Now we're in 1862, but still not to the Militia Act yet, but this is after Confederate conscription. I mean, just the numbers of these things, right? Now we're in October, the Militia Act has taken place. And then blue dots you see specifically pick up, right? The blue dots are gaining in numbers now. Now we're clear into 1863 after the Emancipation Proclamation. This thing starts moving fast now. Notice how quickly the blue dots are moving into the South. This is not just because um, the Emancipation Proclamation had paved the way to incorporate black people into this military effort. 
it's because those black people that were incorporated into the military effort have a lot of knowledge about that area. Before the Union Army is trying to uh, initiate these huge military coordinated events into an area of which they have no knowledge. Now they have people on their side who have intimate knowledge of this area. And this thing is picking up fast. To think that there was ever a chance that you could turn back freedom after this, no way. We're still in 1864 here. And now we're in 1865, just now. Now the uh, 13th Amendment is on the political agenda. And in just a second, you will see Galveston pop up right there. So now we're at the moment of Juneteenth. We saw a lot of freedom moments before that. And so it's interesting to think about Juneteenth and Texas being the last. But let's go back to the timeline again real quick. 1865 becomes this huge year for emancipation. Again, the 13th Amendment passes Congress. And as we know, on April 9th, 1865, Robert E. Lee surrenders at Appomattox. Now, the Confederacy writ large, the folks in Richmond, surrender immediately after as well. And we often consider that the end of the Confederacy. But the Army of the Trans-Mississippi West in Texas, they didn't surrender at all. They kept fighting and considered themselves an independent Confederate nation. They weren't the only ones. Thousands of refugees, former slave owners, having been defeated by the Union Army, flee into Texas. There's still this dream that the Confederacy all could not be lost. There's this moment in Texas and the Confederacy had had these huge dreams before. After they whooped the Union, they were going to march into Mexico and take over Mexico and make it a slave society. Then into Central America, then into South America, clear down to Argentina, and there would be a beacon of a slave holding society in the Americas. That was the dream. That was the long game. It didn't work out. After Robert E. Lee surrenders at Appomattox and the Army of the Trans-Mississippi West decides that they're going to keep going, the United States government sends soldiers from Appomattox to finish the job in Texas. This includes the seven units of the colored troops, United States colored troops that were employed at Appomattox at that time. I wanna sort of think about our timeline again in that light. If secession starts in 1860 and the Civil War breaks out in 1861 and the Confederate draft in 1862, then you can see again this moment of critical masses of enslaved people leaving. If we think about 1862 and 1863 as the policy that creates space to incorporate Black Americans into the United States military and the Civil War effort, then again, you can see how slowly this thing became about freedom. Now, make no mistake, the Confederacy seceded and tried to start a nation, an independent nation, to construct a slave society. But the United States was not fighting back as a means to abolish slaves in 1860. But by 1863, with the tide of the war turned and all those blue dots down there at the bottom of the map, now the war was about freedom. It had been made about freedom by black people who had fought hard to get to that point. By 1863, the United States government is putting out propaganda like this to recruit black soldiers. And as military policy, this thing totally worked. When I hear my colleagues say that Gettysburg changed the course of the war, I often wonder if this is not a large part of why. The Emancipation Proclamation is a kickoff policy that turns a civil war within the South into part of the big civil war happening nationwide. And it opens the door for some of the most memorable liberation battles of the war. It turns knowledge and things like I say that had been happening since slavery had been happening 
and it joins it with Union military support. Take the June 2nd, 1863 Combahee River Raid. In this move, Harriet, T in this move, Harriet Tubman leads uh, Union forces of over 150 men into battle at the Combahee River. After the fort collapsed, soldiers made sure to march up river and liberate the enslaved people there. This is one of those moments. Now, hey, we all know Harriet Tubman had been going in and out of the South doing this exact same work for decades. Now, with the joining forces of the United States military behind her, this thing has become about abolition. In Wilmington, North Carolina, Black Wilmingtonians played a part in liberation also. Uh, in January of 1865, Union forces defeated the Confederate forces at Fort Fisher. Now, Fort Fisher wasn't just some random fort. It had been the location where the army for Robert E. Lee had been being supplied. This is where all of the supplies came in. The Atlantic at that time was known, at that location was known as the graveyard of the Atlantic. The waters there, treacherous. And again, without intimate knowledge of those waterways, that was a military victory. It may have never happened, but it did. And after that defeat, soldiers again, march up as liberating armies. Marching up the Cape Fear River to Wilmington, Black Wilmingtonians took to the streets, literally jumping for joy and welcoming the Black soldiers that brought liberation to them. One woman sees her son in this moment for the first time since he'd escaped slavery. He marched into Wilmington with the 37th U.S. Colored Infantry, and another Black soldier described the scene. There goes my son, exclaimed a lady. Which one, asked a corporal. That one just gone ahead. And sure enough, it was her son. She overtook him and embraced him and how proudly she felt. None but those similarly situated could ever feel. How difficult it must have been for the son to leave his mother, not knowing if she would survive the dangers of slavery and the war. How powerful it must have been to march back to the city that day with a U.S. eagle on button and a musket on his shoulder he had left his home a slave, one fellow soldier wrote, but he had returned in the garb of a Union soldier, free, a man. The victory that cut off supplies to Robert E. Lee's Army of Virginia delivered a fatal blow to the Confederacy. Lee would surrender just a couple months later at Appomattox on April 9th. This is an image from a field hospital in Virginia after that moment at Appomattox. For these men, this war is not over. The U.S. military had a policy of mustering out Black units last, in part because they hadn't organized those units until 1863. This is a reality that would result in the vast majority of United States soldiers in the West being Black. But this moment, fresh off victory at Appomattox, these men were being sent as part of a multiracial 2,000 man army to reclaim Texas and end this thing once and for all. This is a picture of men from the 31st United States Colored Troops who were among those who were sent to Texas. So were these. This is the battle flag of the 20 2nd Regiment of United States Colored Troops. They went to Texas too. This is a picture book by one of the 25th United States Colored Troops. And on the left is an image of a Buffalo soldier wearing the trademark Buffalo robe that the unit adopted. For five days from June 9th to the 13th, ships sailed southwest from Appomattox through rough seas and came to anchor outside the sandbar at Brazos, Santiago. However, it was flood season and the Rio Grande River had overflowed its banks. Uh, this meant these guys had to turn around. They were ordered to Aransas Pass, Texas near Corpus Christi and on June 18th, they arrived at Galveston Bar. The news of freedom came by boat to Galveston and it is here that Black soldiers arrived. Now there's some word that when they arrived, they started telling the stevedores what was coming. 
and black stevedores in Galveston then spread the word. And it is in unknown how much people knew by the time everybody was ordered to gather in the town square in Galveston, Texas, where general order number three was read. On May 26, 1865, less than two months after Lee's surrender, the Army of the Trans-Mississippi uh, West unceremoniously surrendered themselves, setting the stage for this moment. Now, this is a history of the process of military abolition that ends with Juneteenth. It's an origin history, but of course, that's not the rest of the story. Felix Haywood went back to the very same plantation he had been enslaved on and continued to work as he had before. The general order read as such. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness, either there or elsewhere. Freedom. There was no turning back, but at the same time, what did freedom mean? This moment in Galveston forced this question. And in some ways it's been talked about many times as sort of the long American revolution, the civil war, right? Where the revolution declared that these principles of freedom were the foundation of the nation. And that the civil war forced us to really decide what we meant by freedom. If I go back to this map here, even after Juneteenth, two states held out to the very last. Delaware and Kentucky did not abolish slavery until the ratification of the 13th Amendment, December 1865. And technically speaking, New Jersey still had some enslaved people too, but that's another story. But the point behind this, and if I can take us back to thinking about this timeline, really is this point that this is part of a military measure of abolition. It sort of asks us a question about whether the abolition of slavery and freedom are the same thing. After that moment in Galveston, the real work began and Juneteenth has to remind us of that. Juneteenth starts as a celebration about all the hard work that went into this moment of freedom. For it to even happen, people had to leave the plantations, illegally run off. They had to find union lines and force the United States government to take notice that they had no intention of going back. Then once the policy came into place to incorporate them into the war effort, they had to fight. Then, they had to start fighting and move their way across the Confederate States of America, finally into Texas, having defeated Robert E. Lee and now the Army of the Trans-Mississippi West and level that final blow. This is a military operation. And it's that final victory in Texas that de delivers a death blow to a hopeful nation that hoped to organize itself around the system of slavery. It's really the defeat of the Confederacy. It's going to take the 13th Amendment, which was also hard fought policy, to actually make slavery something that's illegal. Like I say, after this moment in Galveston, this is when the real work begins. For many people, it was about finding family. These are newspaper ads that happen everywhere immediately after the abolition of slavery comes. One of the first things people do after abolition is try to track down family that's been lost to them through slavery. 
This one reads, I desire to find my lost relatives. My mother's name was Fanny Scott. My sister's name was Queen Victoria Scott. Brother's name was Patience Scott. My name is Eloise Scott. We were all owned by a man by the name of Samuel Scott. He lived near Lynchburg, Virginia, near a little place called May's Grocery. I was bought by a Negro trader by the name of Peter Hunter just before the war. Any information concerning my relatives will be cheerfully received by Mrs. E. T. Hill, Nee Scott and she gives her address. There's countless of these. I mean, countless of them. They're all over the place. There are databases devoted to them. Family was priority. And abolition brought about another crucial question. What does freedom mean? Are abolition and freedom the same thing? It's an interesting question to keep thinking about. It would be another two years before the 14th Amendment guaranteed equal rights under the law and birthright citizenship. And that was another huge battle. To pass, it had necessitated the passage of the Reconstruction Acts, which granted black men the right to vote in the states of the former Confederacy. That too was a military measure, only enacted as a result of military victory. It was those newly enfranchised black voters who ultimately ratified the 14th Amendment. It's another five years before the 15th Amendment gave black men the right to vote federally. In states of the North, the Reconstruction Acts hadn't applied at all. It was only a military measure after all. That too passed with the votes of Southern black men. Neither of those pieces of policy probably would have passed had that voting right move not come first. Juneteenth is the celebration of the long fight. Freedom did not come automatically with abolition. Indeed, in the years after the 13th Amendment, the nation hotly debated the meaning of freedom. It was a debate brought on by this moment. Can you be free without equal rights under the law? Can you be free without the vote? It was a legitimate debate. Juneteenth is the story of a culmination of Freedom Days that were won specifically through the Civil War. Again, what I said earlier, I always thought that Juneteenth was a Western thing. And when I went to college on the East Coast, and I went to the University of Maryland and I discovered that in you know, Washington, D.C., they, they celebrated their Freedom Day on April 16th. April 16th, 1862 had been the day that slavery had been abolished there. I want us to see that Juneteenth is this culmination of Freedom Days, one specifically through the Civil War. This is about military victory. It is a holiday celebrating the abolition of slavery and the Confederate States of America. And that is as good an occasion for an American holiday as any I've ever heard. And as we celebrate that, it's also a reminder that freedom is a constant struggle that needs dedicated protections. Even without the structure of slavery, racial oppression continued. And despite the gains made during Reconstruction, new systems would arise to challenge freedom based on concepts of racial hierarchy. In Texas, Juneteenth has been celebrated every year since that day in Galveston Town Square. And the victories of Reconstruction came under attack. Black Texans held tightly to Juneteenth. When they were banned from using public parks, despite paying public taxes, they united to buy community land. In 1872, Black leaders in Texas raised $1,000 for the purchase of 10 acres to celebrate Juneteenth. Today, that's known as Houston's Emancipation Park. These photographs show Juneteenth displaying freedom and pride. These pictures are stark to me because they are taken right at the midst of a new system, Jim Crow segregation, a system in which the government distributed rights and resources based on race, a hierarchy of race. And in these Juneteenth photos, I see an attempt to resist that entire belief. The struggle continued. It was 1937 when Felix Haywood reflected back on emancipation in Texas. 
it's sort of interesting to think about, right? I mean, that original quote from him talking about how everybody was singing and everybody was dancing and soldiers, soldiers everywhere, and they had brought freedom just like that. We was free, he said. It was 1937 when he reflected back on emancipation in Texas. He had lived through slavery, abolition, political rights and reconstruction, lynching terrorism, the loss of political rights and Jim Crow, World War I, and the second rise of the Ku Klux Klan, the Jazz Age, the Great Depression. And he spoke to a New Deal interviewer about that day, the New Deal. The past is never dead, it's not even past. Juneteenth. Juneteenth is not the celebration of a conclusion. The reason to celebrate is an occasion to come together every year and take an accounting, an accounting of freedom, to listen, listen for the voices of those calling for freedom and commit to solidarity. In that way, Juneteenth is both a celebration of the fight before and a rededication to the fight ahead. A time to re-energize for the struggle that never stops. The defense and maintenance and expansion of freedom for all. I admit that Juneteenth is my favorite of all the freedom days celebrated around the country. And not just because I'm a Westerner, but because it's the last freedom day of not only the civil war between North and South, but the Southern Civil War between the plantocracy and the enslaved. And celebrating that is rather beautiful. All slaves may not have been free after Juneteenth, especially if we expand outside of the United States. And the history of the West is going to bring new problems. But there's a concept here that I think is worth celebrating, that nobody is really free until we're all free. Thank you all. I was excited to give you a little bit of history about Juneteenth there. Um, and, you know, I would love to hear questions and talk more about this. I specifically wanted to leave some room um, for us to talk and have questions because I, I would love to continue the conversation um, and talk more about this history or any other questions you might have for me. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Um, Really appreciate, oh, my head looks really good. I uh, really appreciate uh, you um, sharing that information. So much information. We can see from the comments um, that uh, people are learning, uh, just like me, learning about so many different things, you know, the military advancement um, and, and, you know, some things we know about, right? So some of the things like the propaganda and how that impacts everything. And that was one of the questions that I wanted to start off with was how important was that? Um, and when we even look at it back then, look at it now, how important, I guess, is the media in all of, of this uh, uh, conversation, um, but especially when it comes down to Juneteenth and, and these times? Yes, absolutely. I hope it does. Uh, it's a great question. I mean, the propaganda for me, especially in my research, is always extremely important. Again, by enslaved people forcing the government to act, they're also forcing this to be part of this political agenda, right? It, it's really them forcing their way onto the political agenda. And so for that to be the case, it, it's definitely, I mean, I'm not, I can't say propaganda is more important than you know, getting bodies with guns in a, during wartime, but the propaganda is extremely important. Uh, it's uh, there's sort of two parts to change during wartime in this. Right, there's the military victory, and then there's also changing the, the hearts and minds, if you will. The propaganda, I think, was important on several reasons, and I mean, why it was used this way. One. Um, is recruitment, of course. The other is to convince Northerners uh, that this is a good thing. Now, I'm definitely not gonna make an argument that the propaganda was designed to, you know, uh, create a post-racial North, but 
it was designed to show, I mean, again, the majority of black folks lived in the South. And so we're also talking about a North that doesn't have a lot of experience. And this type of propaganda is about trying to create a sort of united Northern front. It's also about this threat to the Confederacy. It is trying to scare the Confederacy. And that is another important war tactic. I mean, riding into Galveston and, you know, mandating that everybody brings themselves and their enslaved people out. I mean, this is the way it was put, right? Um, that's, that's war propaganda too, right? I mean, sort of, that's a, a sign of victory to force folks to come out. It's interesting also, you know, what I tried to get to at the end by bringing back up Felix Haywood and that he, you know, ultimately, you know, I don't want to say returns to life as normal because we need to recognize that abolition is abolition. Um, but that it wasn't the, you know, the economic life changing, you know, he still was without these rights. And so in that way, um, it's sort of funny to think about how it's this big media propaganda moment. Oh, it's all about freedom. But at the same time, there's no actual policy that's a, added to that that's actually doing the work of freedom, right? It's back to this. Is, immense, is the abolition of slavery and freedom the same thing? Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, a lot of questions. So let's let's try to tackle them one at a time. All right. So uh, and the first question is kind of a question that someone answered, but we want to make sure that everybody understands. So um, one question is about um, the recognition uh, as a holiday of Juneteenth. We know what was just signed by the president. Um, and so one of the questions is how many states currently recognize Juneteenth as a holiday? And then a follow up to that. Because one of the people in the comments answered, it's a federal holiday. So all 50 states, right? And I guess that is a question, you know, is, is you know, by it being a federal holiday, we know that there is at least one state that doesn't recognize MLK Day. Uh, so um, uh, when it comes to this day being a, a holiday, um, is it because it's a federal holiday, are all states mandated or, you know, can folks back out? That's a that's a great question. Uh, th this is a, a great question that I do not have all of the answers for. I'm going to say up front, but I do have some of the answers for. Um, a federal holiday does mean that we all celebrate it federally, but that also does not supersede states being able to recognize or not recognize on their own. I mean, definitely federal employees within every state would be observing. So any you know a national archives that's in california for example is still federal work and federal job and under the jurisdiction of the federal government but for example you know california state archives under the jurisdiction of the state and the state would have final say on that type of thing um and the issue of private companies is another one that's sort of interesting to think about and that that i think would depend on the state but i'm not sure um so this is an interesting point that's actually sort of interesting to the history too about you know what powers are states and what powers are federal and how those interact. Um, it definitely is still up to states whether states will also individually recognize any holiday, I think. Okay, oh, great. great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, and it's important to know because some people may be thinking, uh, you know, just because it's a federal holiday now, I can just, you know, go to my employer and say I'm off. Like, well, not so much. Got to check in. Um, so, yeah, that's good. And then there's a question now on the screen. Uh, thank you, Joy, for putting that up. As some organizations work to become more aware in what positive ways do you think this will impact local yeah, this is a great question. I was really hoping I, I was asked as well, right? I mean, so giving the sort of history of Juneteenth, I, I hope that one of the things I got across was this dual nature of it, right? Um, there's, I, I, and this is something we're sort of creating as we go, as far as it being nationalized. But I think that as the history of Juneteenth, one thing that Juneteenth has to have, one element, has to be community service. That's always something that is part of the holiday. 
Um, that that can't be overlooked. Uh, all the times we celebrated Juneteenth, I'm from San Jose, California. Um, we have fantastic organizations there and it's always a part of organizing and doing some local community work. So I think that, you know, this is a conversation we sort of have with having MLK Day to bring up, right? Like, well, what do we do for this holiday <laughs> kind of thing? Um, and I really do want to stress that this is, this is also, this is an accounting. This is a time for an accounting. So somebody asked me earlier, right? Uh, at, a, at another event, what, should we, you know, what do you hope people are doing next year on Juneteenth? And I answered, well, I think the question should be, what do I plan on doing between now and next Juneteenth? <laughs> and that's sort of the question that comes out of celebrating Juneteenth. I mean, community service work is tiring. It's hard work. And I do want to say also, that I think Juneteenth is, a, it's time to get together get your hugs in, get a plate, um, and get ready to do some more work, right? <laughs> and so it's a day of love and it's a day of joy. And so I think that it, it's, it's supposed to revive us to keep going. Um, and so I really do think that the, you know, the question is not, what should we do next year on Juneteenth? But you know, knowing that it's an accounting, what will we do between now and Juneteenth? And then next Juneteenth, we can get together and talk about all the cool things we did <laughs> over some food. And so, <laughs> yeah. Yep. And the history, right? And what's next? Uh, well, to your point, you know, between that time frame, you know, getting together, um, and this is something we had talked about before, hopefully turns into something that is community. You know, it, it really does, you know, move people forward to where you can start looking at. So what are we gonna do the next time? Not necessarily where we're gonna get together, right? Not, right. I mean, right. A part of it. that's a part of it. But doing, Joy's a part of it, but. <laughs> exactly, the conversation should include uh, more. You yes. know? And, to, and to that point, one of the questions that we have um, is, I know Joy has one on the screen now, but I'm gonna jump to a different room from Jack, Jacqueline Cole. What are some suggestions on how to start a conversation on what is probably an, an, un, an un, uncomfortable topic for some people? It's a good question. I mean, I'm, I've been, I, I've sort of been thinking about this. I mean, I, I'm sort of back and forth on this. I don't know that, okay, I'm going to speak Frank. I don't know that Juneteenth is the uncomfortable conversation. I, you know, Again, uh, this is in part thinking about what holidays do for us and what we mean by a national holiday. And it kind of ties back to that first question, right? About what, you know, it do as everybody have to recognize it kind of thing. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I think that thinking about national holidays more generally, um, you, they don't do the heavy lifting work uh, of, of justice, right? I mean, so there's that. But they are also about the stories we tell ourselves uh, to construct our own identity, if we will, like as a nation, right? If we were talking about, you know, because we could talk about Freedom Days on a larger level than just the United States, of course, right? Um, and I think that that's interesting. But, you know, I'm not sure. I, I think that Juneteenth is a pretty clear cut military pattern of freedom uh, is very, it, it has to be about the civil war. I mean, general order number three, it's a general order. It's a military order that's that's being in part celebrated. Um, and so it's part, it, it is this sort of, it was sort of interesting this year, the attention to both Memorial Day being something that is part of a freedom day, right? That after enslaved people were freed, then they you know, took this time to give proper burials to Union soldiers. It, and it, this is all part of the same march, right? There really is a march for freedom that's going on here that's different from, say, you know, enslaved people that didn't find freedom until December of that year, once the policy was ratified. Um, this is a specific military march. And so I guess I hope 
that you know, I specifically constructed this origin story to not be difficult. <laughs> so <laughs> that was done on purpose, right? Like I, I hope that that's a story that all Americans can say, oh, dang, that's cool, right? <laughs> I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that these people like had this freedom moment and marched off of these plantations and forced their way onto the political agenda and took down the Confederacy and, you know, helped prevent an invasion of Mexico for a slave society. There's a lot of things that I think are super easy and cool. I mean, this is like, you know, <laughs> where's the movie? But, but I do get that, um, you know, race can be a difficult conversation and I think that's okay. I think cool stories help. Um, I hope they do. And I think that thinking about the narrative we want to use to talk about ourselves, um, it is not only important, but it's fun. And I think it should be fun, right? I mean, I don't think that it has to be difficult. And so, um, but difficult conversations are going to be difficult. And sometimes you just have to have those tough conversations. And so, you know, if this opens the door as a way to have a difficult conversation, um, then I think that's okay too. I think difficult conversations are cool too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's good. It's it it, it it kind of all can be packaged together. Uh, and I think I like the way that you mentioned, you know, trying to present it in a way where it, it is really um, educational, you know, not necessarily something that pushes a button, but, right. you know, starts a conversation, helps people kind of understand and, and absorb this um, for a lot of people is brand new. Um, and so it's like, OK, what does this mean? Um, so it kind of gets to, and you were leading to this question that's up now, what can we do to help spread the word, right? And the importance yeah. of participating in this this holiday, this this time. It's a great question. And one thing I thought a lot about when I was actually preparing for this was when I decided that, oh, this would be, I'm going to try to come up with my own holiday origin story, historical origin story, you know, like based off of my research. And, um, and so that, it, it was sort of fun for me. And so I start, and one thing I definitely recognized doing it, it was almost like as I was doing it, I was thinking there's too much, there's so much, I wanna say too much, right? And so I whittle and I whittle, but what occurred to me immediately was how many freedom stories there are. There are so many freedom stories out there. They're amazing, they're so amazing. And so, you know, I think that by checking out different databases, um, there are, you know, so many great books about this, like the National Archives has a fantastic thing right now where they've pulled out actual documents from this type of thing. Texas State Archives, their website has fantastic documents, Library of Congress. Um, the, there are uh, a lot of historical sources out there and they'll lead you to fantastic research by other fantastic historians. Um, I would be happy to post some of them. I see that my website's on there on my own site, a little follow up. Um, I will be happy to post on there with a reading list and I, I will do that today. But I just I, I want to say that how many freedom stories there are out there um, and what an amazing history this is. And so I hope that also, you know, it's out there. Believe me, um, you'll find amazingly cool stories to keep on pressing. And I even myself just from doing this thought, I think I'm going to make more out of this. I can really build off of some of these freedom stories. So I was even inspired by thinking and talking to you all today to, you know, expand on some of these stories, find out more about some of these guys. Very, that's so very true. Um, okay. So 1258. So I know we're, we're coming up on the hour and um, we so much appreciate Dr. Jackson, what you have given to us in really more like 50 minutes, 40 to 50 minutes, um, squeezing in as much as you did um, while um, not feeling like, you know, we're kind of being um, uh, overloaded. You know, I think it was, yeah, really appreciate your intention and, and providing that overview and that guidance to us to be able to learn and inspire us to think a little deeper. Some of the comments people are, sharing are related to that, you know, what about, you know, what am I going to do? You know, what, what are some of the things that, 
you know, will will come out of this. Community service is one that's resonating with some folks. Um, and that's great. That's exactly what, you know, we would love to see happen. Uh, so before I do uh, kind of a final closing here, any last comments or last words that you have for us, Dr. Jackson? Um, I, again, I just want to thank you for having me. Uh, this was fantastic. Um, I, I want to give a, a shout out to my hometown, Juneteenth, San Jose, California, African American Community Service Agency. <laughs> I got to give a shout out to them. If you're in Santa Clara County, if you're in San Jose, they have some amazing events going on um, as usual every year. So uh, thank you for sharing this with me and happy Juneteenth. Thank you. Yes, uh, San Jose Bay Area is always in the lead. Um, yeah, yeah, we have an office actually in San Jose as well, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but thank you, Dr. Jackson, for joining us. We really appreciate you spending this time. And it's something that we, um, we're hoping to continue um, in terms of conversation. And maybe, you know, next year or in between now and next year, we can try to see if maybe we can work together and do some other things that will, again, continue to bring uh, more light to, uh, to this very important day. I'd love to. Um, Big fan of the AARP. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So a um, few things to wrap up for everyone that's listening or watching. Um, keep in mind, uh, we do have more things that we I shared earlier that are going to be taking place this month for Black Music Month. You can always find them. Go to aarp.org slash forward slash Black Music Month. Uh, this recording will stay on our California Facebook page, so you can always go back to it, share it, comment in the comment section, even if it's not live, um, and, and, and be engaged that way. We have some events, again, coming up for Black Music Month that are on the site, but just to highlight a few, a concert series with KJLH that starts Monday, and it goes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week at 9 p.m., and you can register on the aarp.org forward slash Black Music Month page. We also have um, an interview that KBLX, shout out to the Bay Area, is uh, doing with Dwayne Wiggins from Tony, Tony, Tony. That is taking place on Tuesday, um, I believe in the, um, oh my gosh, I'm going to mess up the time, but Tuesday. And you can find that as well on our page. Um, there's also another conversation with the Black Music Month conversation series that our executive council member Michael Dolphin is having. He has, a, he has a conversation coming up with Leroy Downs and Yvette Devereaux. I mentioned those earlier. Um, and so those are some of the things that we have coming up for this month. Um, you can always visit our aarp.org forward slash CA page to find out about more events and activities that are taking place. We have workshops and a lot of things that are happening um, right now. And again, one last final thank you to our special guest, Dr. Tonight Jackson, uh, for being on with us. Another shout out to the staff behind the scenes, Joy Hepp and Atisha Jones, and some of the volunteers you may have seen in the comment or chat uh, area, um, Alvita E. Smith, Vince King, um, Joyce Howard, Marla Anderson, thank you all for being on. And for all of you who are paying attention, who are listening, who, who took some time out of your day today to be with us, we appreciate it. We hope you learned something different or new that will inspire you to dig a little deeper and consider what you will do in this, uh, these next 365 days um, before the, the next uh, Juneteenth um, um, acknowledgement. Uh, so again, thank you for your time this afternoon and have a great rest of your day. Thank you guys.